Okay, so go ahead, Kara. Okay, so on the scenes, I didn't glue it down to the page yet because I'm not sure what it is you want to see in a picture. Do you want like everything, like the bad side, the good side, the side view? Beautiful, excellent, excellent, excellent question. So when I had the book out, I showed you that you could put it on. You want to just, and you don't even have to glue it. You can just staple the top two corners. Normally what I ask you to do is do that so I can look at both sides. In this situation, what you can do is just do the top two corners. And on your template, just show, I'll try and get the French seam out. Which the front seam is my favorite, by the way. That's the one you're working on right now. That's that one. Okay, so if you have this all set to go in your French seam, you can actually see how this is just stapled, one in each corner. Yeah. Don't glue it because, oh dear, I'm, I'm out of, okay. Sorry, it looks like my internet's gonna be really bad. I couldn't get on today. Are you guys hearing me now? Yeah. Yeah, we still see you and hear you. Okay, because I'm frozen on my end. So if you have your template this way, stapled on the corners, you can take a picture. This is your back side, and just fold your front side up. Uh, okay, so you see both. The and same. that way you can make it go on your page and I can see both. Okay. Because really, uh, you know, this is what I, this is what I need to see right here. Right. So that's perfect. Just fold it up. So let me see the backside and fold it up and that will work for any of the samples. So for example, welt seam. Right here. Welt seam. And then however you have have been able to finish your underside. I'll see this and I'll see both your stitching and then I'll see your top side. Okay. okay, very good question. And what other questions, Kara? And everyone else think of your questions. So I spent hours trying to do my buttonhole. I, hold on, I even have my sample and my needle on the settings on the Bernina kept getting stuck like in the material like over and over so then I switched to doing a zigzag which I actually like more but or better so far but my question is I'm confused am I are you supposed to do one side stop cut it then do the short side or do you pivot in the the um zigzag for the buttonhole, do you pivot and keep going or do you stop each length? Excellent question. And let me just show you a buttonhole and this might be helpful with the zigzag. If you just wanna work zigzag, totally fine, but here's a little trick. So when you work zigzag, you <laughs> go down one side and then at the end, just make your zigzag wider. So if you're working first with like a, a two and you need to have your stitches a little bit closer together than what you have. So you're going to do, maybe you'll put it at one or 1 1.5, you zigzag down. So your stitch length is at one or 1 1.5 and your stitch width to zigzag is at two. And then you're gonna put it wider to five to do, go across the end. Then you can pivot and stitch back the other way, and then you put it wider. So I'm gonna do that on the board for you. So wider means we change the number up or down? You change the number of your zigzag bigger. So let's look at it this way. So for years I had an old Singer machine 
and I could only do buttonholes exactly the way that you're talking about. So you want to first establish your stitch length. And this is going to be buttonhole manually. Okay, so you're not going to use a, you're not going to use a buttonhole device. Let me just get this up a little bit. Sorry, I have all these boxes that I put the machine up so that you can see what I'm doing. Okay. So this buttonhole, I think it might be better that way. Here we go. There we go, I can make it even. Okay, so the stitch length, put it about at one to 1 1.5. So zero stitch length means that it stitches in one place, okay? It means there's no forward progress. 1 to 1.5 means you're going to go at a small forward progress. 5 to 8, whichever your machine has, is a big basting stitch like that, right? So stitch length, normally we're at 2.5. You want it to be smaller because you want it to be close together. So that's the first thing you want to do is do your stitch length. And kind of play around with this. When we do the automatic buttonhole, we do it at 0.5. So just see, very good idea to do your samples and just see what you're doing by putting it in and zigging and see if you can make forward progress. It should be fairly close together, like no real gaps in between the stitch, okay? That's your stitch length. The stitch width is what is going to happen with the zigzag. So then you fix your stitch width. Okay, that is the width of the zigzag. Now you know zero is straight, no stitch width. You have no width, you're going straight. The minute you deviate from that, let's say I'm gonna do 0.5, I'm gonna go like this. If I'm gonna do one to two, you know, I'm gonna get wider. Now remember, this is your stitch length. This portion is your stitch width. Okay, does that all make sense? So what you want to do when you're creating this manual buttonhole, and I'm gonna move over to this side now, Okay, I'm frozen. There we go. Okay, so when you're going to create a manual buttonhole, you will set your stitch length and your stitch width as discussed on this side. You will start by stitching, I'm gonna make this bigger so you can see it, towards you. When you get to the end, instead of uh, stopping it, just put your stitch width to the widest five and it'll go all the way across, right? And you want this to be at 0.5 because this will be 0.5 length to make it very close together. But width will be five. And you can change it as you're going like that? 
or stop and then you can change it? As long as your needle is in the upright position. Okay. Okay, that is really important. Excellent question. Needle must be in the upright position. Full up. Okay, your take up lever is in the full upright position. Then when you move your stitch width, your needle won't break. So then you can have your stitch length be five and your stitch width, your stitch length be 0.5 and your stitch uh, width be five. Then you can leave your needle and pivot your fabric so that you are then stitching. You're gonna move it so it's like this. This has already been done and now you're gonna stitch depending on which way you pivot. Now you will stitch back this way. When you get to your line, remember you have your line here. When you get to your line, lift your needle up, make the stitch width go wider. Then when you get to the end, maybe do six times of that back and forth zigzag. When you get to the end, put your needle up and then put everything to zero and it will stitch in place and that will lock the end of the buttonhole. So stitch length is at zero, stitch width is at zero, and that locks the end of the buttonhole. Does that make sense to everybody? That's a manual buttonhole. You absolutely can do it that way. It's harder to do, I mean, when you have like tiny buttonholes, because it's really hard to see between the presser foot and your material. And so you kind of just have to go slow. That is absolutely correct. Okay. This is one of the most advanced techniques. Okay. It's kind of difficult and you just get used to it. Now there, I will show you a way you can do hand, hand bound buttonholes too. In fact, I have a garment here that I'll show you. This was typical before we had the buttonhole template for the straight stitch machine and before we had um, the zigzag on the machine. So you would do a hand bound buttonhole and I'll show you. Often for baby clothes, it's hand bound. So let me just show you hand bound buttonhole. This is a child's garment from the 20s, okay? Identified by the low waisted pocket, the low pleats, the absolute straight down of the garment. You can see here's a sleeve detail that's remnant uh, from the early part of the 1900s. And in the back, this has hand stitched buttonholes. So you can see that this buttonhole is turned onto a facing and hand stitched. And the facing is on the inside, just like what we did with our buttonhole, okay? So here's the inside. You can see the hand done knots on this edge. It's stitched around to connect that fabric. And it's hand stitched. So on very small buttonholes, that's totally acceptable. And remember this garment is from the twenties and this has lasted. And I can see that it's a worn garment and here's the button going through here, right? And so it's a garment. This is not a fancy dress garment. This is an everyday garment and it was completely functional and wearing. It's, we're really lucky to have a garment of this nature. So this is called a buttonhole stitch. And you could certainly do one of these as an extra credit and I'll be happy to demonstrate that as well. So what happens is when you slash the buttonhole, the top layer of your hand stitching is finishing that edge along there. And then you take a bite into your facing to control it. Okay. So absolutely, you can do it. The small ones you can do by hand and you can even get very good at these in a small size. That's why your button is pretty big and you can do a five eighths inch button. So you know what, Cara? 
applause to you because you really figured out something that was um, complicated, but that you got it, you got, you figured something out and then you were able to ask a really good question. So other questions? I do have one more, sorry, everyone. <laughs> no, 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 this is helpful for everybody. This is more like user error. Well, I feel like I constantly have to rethread my needle. So, uh, okay, a excellent question. I'm gonna address that when we sit at the sewing machine. Okay. That is a very common, very common. Okay. Um, like I feel like I'm doing something wrong because I'm constantly having to. It is, it's the way you finish the previous exercise. Oh, perfect. So that's okay. why. So absolutely no problem whatsoever. That is a really, really typical thing. Completely okay to, I'm glad you said that. Cause you know what? Everybody does that. Okay. And you know, I told you, I've done everything probably 10 times, way more than you guys, because nobody ever taught me really how to do things. Both uh, my, my previous costume shop manager and myself, we'd said, well, you know, we learned to sew by following the pattern instructions on a pattern. So you make a lot of mistakes. And then finally, we both independently, we, we've known each other for over 30 years, but independently, we both got the Vogue sewing book. And it's like, oh, we can understand this. Oh, oh, you can just look up in the index how to do this. Oh, this is really great. <laughs> And now it's probably online. So, you know, we were working pre-internet and pre-online. So let's um, let's go on to understitching. I'm going to screen share and show you the understitching and fill in the page first. Then we'll come back here and you can have a split screen if you wanna look at the instructions while I demo it on the board. And then I will actually sit down and demo it at the machine. And when I sit down, I will answer Carr's question about why your thread keeps pulling out of your needle. So let's go to back to understitching. Let me see if it's here we go. So here's our understitching preview. There's a just a definition for it first. Understitching is simply stipping, stitching a line close to the edge of a facing to keep the facing from rolling to the outside of the garment, okay? So a facing is something that you put on the inside of a garment to finish it, just like what I showed you in that little dress that had the buttonhole. It's to finish the edge. It comes in handy when sewing around a neckline. Any curved edge, this is going to be extremely helpful. We've done it on the front of a vest because it has a very long V and we don't want that facing to roll out. And I'm sure many of you have put on a garment and then there's this thing that's sticking out and it's so unattractive. It keeps the facing or the lining firmly inside your garment without any stitches showing on the outside. So this is a couturier, um, this is a couturier method. Here's a little video. So if you get confused, you can do this video, which is gonna be slightly different than my video. Here is the document that I will actually fill in. Wait a minute, stop. Okay uh while we're discussing this and let me see if i can go up and edit so if i edit this i can fill it in so this will be how the, this is filled in nope i don't think i can okay mm, i'm a little hesitant to fool around with this because without saving it, I could lose the entire page and it's a lot of work. <laughs> All right, let's see what I can do here. So you click on this and we'll just go through each question. Why can't I go up higher? There we go. So under stitching, remember you have a textbook that you can look at and that is very beneficial. I'm just going to double check that it is still exactly page 199 in case I have made a mistake. Because I just actually copied that blindly. And well, a couple of the things that we discussed trimming, grading, and clipping are on page 198. 
So that is a really important, so it's close enough so that you can see it, okay? So the purpose of this is to prevent, in this portion, you want to write prevent the seam from rolling to the right side. So this is a, this is a prompt for you to fill in. So the first thing is to prevent the seam from rolling out to the right side. To help a curved seam lie flat, and we're going to use the pieces that are cut for you, place your interfacing against your facing with right sides together, stitch a 5 eighths inch, our standard seam allowance, grade the seam allowance. This means to create a stair step, and I'll show you how to do that. Cut the garment seam allowance the longest, clip all seam allowances, turn and press, stitch on top of the facing close to the seam line, close to the stitching line. These are the instructions from above as well. Turn and press. Okay, we're gonna stop share there. So you'll want to fill that in and I'm going to just show on the board and with my sample. So that you can see a variety of you can see a, a, a series of steps. And then I'll show you at the sewing machine. So first of all, under stitching looks, uh, it really is very effective on a curved edge. And here's my curved edge. And we're talking about this tiny stitching line right here. It, it is different from top stitch because it is not seen on the right side. There's nothing on the right side showing this at all, okay? But on the inside, we see this stitching line. I'll do it with contrasting thread when I'm showing you so that you can see it more clearly. Here's a straight sample. It's not as effective this way. Here's my instruction material, and here's my straight sample. You will be working with your curved sample, but this I can use to demonstrate because I have left the side open. So here's my facing. This is my garment side, right? This is the right side of my garment that's to my page. This is my facing and my understitching, my, my Interfacing is here. I have stitched very close to my seam. I've clipped it so that it will lie flat. And now it's in red. You can see that you see the red on this side, but on the right side of the garment, no stitching shows whatsoever. Okay, so we will do this on the board. Your sample looks like this. you have a piece that is imitating a neckline. You have, a, this is gonna show you, this is the wrong side. This is a pattern notation that when we do this kind of a mark, you're looking at the wrong side. You have a facing. And this has a right and a wrong side like this has a right and a wrong side. And then you have an interfacing. Okay. And this is iron on. And it is white. So this has a raw edge, right? This has little frays that are sticking out. It's a raw edge. The whole purpose of this, of a facing, is to make this a finished 
edge. So we will be ironing this interfacing to here. That's number one. Then we will put right sides together. So I'm going to look at this side of my facing of my garment. This is what you've got. Here's my right side of my garment. I'm going to put the facing on top of it. Then I'm looking at the wrong side of the facing that has the interfacing attached. So we're going to, number one, apply the iron-on interfacing to the facing, then put right sides together. Okay, so that's the right side. If I flip this up, it's the right side of my facing. Now I'm looking at the right side of my garment. You can tell the difference, okay? Third, stitch at 5 eighths of an inch. This is just our standard straight stitch, 2.5, whatever you use. So then I'm gonna be stitching here. Okay, there's my stitching line. I'm going to grade the seam allowances. So when you're working with a garment, you're going to have some bulk in this section because now I have one layer of interfacing, one layer of facing and one layer of outer of my garment. And then I'm going to turn this so I'm gonna have all those layers together. So you want to grade your seam allowance and you do that by trimming this edge. So to trim this edge, I'm gonna take my scissors and cut one layer, cut one layer at a time of seam allowance only. So here's my seam allowance. For clarity, I'm not going to use the mark to indicate inside out. So I'm going to cut one layer and that's going to be this inside layer that has the white attached to it. So the first one will be the white layer. And I'm just gonna cut here. Then I'm looking at a shorter quarter inch piece of my white lining and a longer piece of the garment. So I'm going to cut this to one quarter inch. Then I'm going to cut my garment seam allowance to three eighths. Now you might say, why am I cutting the garment piece? Because first of all, this is, this is longer. So you wanna make sure that at this point when we turn it, it is the narrowest and the least possible. So from profile view, you're making, here's your seam allowance with all these layers. Here's my stitching line. So I'm cutting my white layer with my facing and then I cut my garment layer so that when I turn this inside out, I'll have this stair step. All right, before I turn it, I'm going to clip. I'm gonna take my scissors and with the end of it, clip to the stitching line, but don't breach the stitching. Okay, so you're clipping to the stitching line only. Because this is a curved edge, this is smaller, and I'm going to make it rest on the inside of this. So by clipping, I can open that up. And that would straighten this piece out so that I can actually then flip it, okay? So the next step after I grade 
I'm going to clip the seam allowance. Then I'm going to press the facing away from the garment. And then I will understitch this all seam allowances to the facing. Okay. And I'm going to show you how to do that right now. Question so far. If you have your little piece that looks like a, uh, I don't know, it looks like a bib or baby clothes or something like that, <laughs> um, then get that out because it's going to look like this at the end. And the great thing is, here's my facing, here's my iron on interfacing, here's the clip, and you can see that because I've clipped it and spread it out, that it makes space in between so that when that narrower edge folds to the inside, it's nice and flat and it's flat this way so that the seam is not buckled and I don't have any ugly edge. And if you see a garment that is distressed right here on a curve, it's because I haven't adequately clipped the inside of the garment. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Hey, Pam. Okay. Question? Uh, sorry, just um, had a comment about the 20s piece. Yes. Um, j just thinking that, you know, how, how unusual it is to have a piece that old and in that great of a condition. And I, I'm not sure that everybody um, quite has a perspective on that, that don't usually have access to garments of that age, it's, it's almost 100 years old and it's, it's still beautiful, so. Well, even, even that's a really great point, Catherine. And even more important than that is this is an everyday garment. Everyday garments were worn out. We really seldom ever get to see an everyday garment. You can see all those beaded garments and the fancy silks that haven't been distressed from, uh, from you know, what happens is there's, a, we'll talk about this in fabric identification something called shot silk. It's they actually put metal into the fiber because as they boiled out the gum, it, the silk is sold by weight. So it made it lighter. So they put in salts and minerals to make it heavier. And that impacted the, the um, integrity of the, of the fabric so that it would shred along the, uh, the, along the metal that they had put in. So you'll see that in beaded garments, but you can actually see some beaded garments, but an actual garment like that, that was perhaps worn by a child, that is an everyday garment, extremely rare. That's really extremely rare because, you know, look at it, it's all done by hand. So there is some sewing machine, which is early sewing machine done by a treadle, which I have one of those at home. I, maybe if I get inspired, I'll show you what that looks like. Um, but, you know, there was so much work put into it that you wore your garment and then you passed it down and then you passed it down and then it became quilt squares. So I have my grandmother's quilt yeah. that was, Sunbonnet Girl, and um, I should bring you in some of those. And those are from some fabrics from the 20s because certain parts of the garment don't wear in the same way. For example, the collar, that would be enough to put on a quilt square and they would repurpose everything. So it's a really exciting, it really is exciting to see it. Thanks for just acknowledging that. So I'm gonna start sewing and I'm looking at my machine. I realize I need to wind a bobbin. So let's review that. This is my bobbin post on this machine. Many of you have a bobbin post and then I have to I have to set that up so that if my bobbin post is in the open position, it will not spin. And I'm gonna, I have no thread on my machine. So I'm gonna show you this, uh, the needle going up and down. going to show you the needle going up and down by pressing on it and you can see that that uh, oh well I have to turn my machine on here we go now my machine is on so if I press that my needle goes up and down but my bobbin does not spin okay because I have not pushed this over 
now when I push it over, you think the bobbin will spin. There's a second thing we remember that we need to do before I can get my bobbin is I need to release this inner wheel. So this takes some muscle. So I'm gonna put it towards me. Okay, now I have released. This is the clutch, just like a clutch on a car. Once I've done this, I've disengaged the gears so that now when I step on my pedal, my needle bar does not go up and down. You can see this is not going up and down, okay? But if I, my bobbin will wind right here. You may not be able to see it, but it's going around. I take my thread, I put it through this, this post. This is much too long of a thread. One thing, try not to work with a bunch of excess thread. It does kind of ball up your machine. And I actually have an idea, Cara, about why your buttonhole is so complicated and I'll show you. So this has an arrow on the top, which shows you that I need to thread this from front to back. That is because they're increasing the tension. If you don't have that, you're gonna thread it from front, back to front. I take it over to my bobbin. I put the, this through a hole in my bobbin. So now I have a thread holding my bobbin here. And I'm going to hold this and it will wind. You can see that it will wind from here through this. And it would automatically stop when it gets that full. I don't need it that full, but I will hold this and it will twist off just by force. So now you can see the post is filling. It didn't twist off, so I'm gonna clip. And you can see that it is filling. I'm just gonna hold this closer. Maybe from the top, you can see it go around. See it going around. And notice how quiet it is because my machine, the gears are not engaged. So the presser foot is not going up and down. Now I'm going to resume engagement so that now when I step on this, this will move, clip, open my bobbin post so that it is not against the winder anymore, lift it off. I'm looking at it, looks good. Everyone's gonna check it out. And then I can re-thread. And one of the things you should get used to doing is threading your machine. Don't hesitate to thread as many times as possible. When something's going wrong, for example, with that buttonhole idea, take your thread out and re-thread. So I'm putting it, drawing it to the left, down, through, my tension through this thread guide, my, my take up lever is in, the, is in the down position. I need it to go in the full upright position so that I can just put it through. This looks like an upside down store kit on almost every machine. This little device looks like an upside down stork. So it's always in the upright position through my thread guide at the needle. And I'll tell you something that I just found yesterday to be interesting from a 90 year old. If you are having problems threading your machine, hold your thread. Let me just get this up really close. Hold your thread in your hand so that I, you can see I have just, you know, three eighths of an inch here, not much. And you can just draw it down your, just drag it down your needle to that opening and push it through. So if you're having a problem seeing it, that might be a help. Drag the end, I'm gonna just move my hand to the side, drag the end of your thread down to that opening. And when it goes to the opening, push it through. That's easier than trying to aim from out here and push it through. So that was just a trick from a 90 year old, you know, always good to learn a new trick. So I thought, wow, that's pretty interesting. I, re I, I think I told you, I remember when I went back to grad school and I had four kids, I was so tired. I could not figure, I could not get my machine to, to thread. I just, I, my eyes were just too burned out. I couldn't make it happen. So even threading can be tough.
right now, non-cooperative. It's partly because I'm at the side of my machine, so I can't really see the hole very well. Okay, there we go. So I have it through. I tend to hold my thread out here and then pull it through so it does not wrap additionally around that point. And again, I'm dropping my needle in my bobbin into my bobbin holder. I'm putting this in so that it will unspool clockwise if you're on a brother or you're on a singer, it may spool the other way. So there's my clockwise motion. Again, this hole on the Bernina is reserved only for buttonholes. And if you're not gonna use the attachment, I'm not sure if you need it. So we're gonna try that, Cara. Hold my flipper so it doesn't fall out. I'm always, I'm always gonna put my hand there just to make sure. I've run, I've run these around the room several times. Put it on my post, click, hold the top thread, engage by pushing this towards me. And then I grab this thread up, comes up, the loop comes up and I have both on the top and I put it through the back of my, my the back of my um, presser foot in this way. So the first thing that I want to do is I'm gonna do my understitching. And at the end of that, I will do a manual buttonhole not using this, but just using zigzag and we'll be able to see that, okay? So first of all, I'm gonna take my pieces apart. This is my interfacing. This is my facing and my facing is right sides together with my garment. So I'm gonna unpin that. And very kindly, we've put a stitching guide on there for you at five eighths of an inch. So I'm unpinning. Step number one, I earn my inner facing onto my facing. When I move to my iron to do this, I wanna make sure that this iron on interfacing is not gluing down to my ironing surface. So I will put a surface down to accommodate that. Here we are at our ironing surface. So I have my right side of my garment down. I have the glue side. Remember, this is two layers. This is the glue side and the non-glue side. Your marking is on your non-glue side. So you're all good. You've got a right side and a wrong side. I'm putting it down carefully and I wanna make sure that I'm not gonna glue my surface. So I will grab another piece of fabric. to put down so that I'm not going to glue my surface together, okay? So I'm putting this on, everyone can see that. I'll, I'll actually do it towards you. Oh, maybe it's better the other way. Okay, now I'm going to glue this on. I'm not gonna run my, knee, my iron very quickly. I'm just simply going to place it on and press very in deliberately because we really want the glue to melt and attach to the garment, to the facing. I'm still working with my grain and then I can lift this up and now I can treat this as one piece, completely individual, okay? There are some pluses and minuses to add to uh, iron-on interfacing. It's not my favorite because it inhibits the actual natural motion of the woven piece. So I can't really work on the bias with this very much because this is, this is a non-woven on this side. So it's not two threads interlocking at 90 degrees. It is a felted piece and it doesn't have the same motion that the woven piece does but it is a very convenient thing to use. And for a small piece where we really don't want motion around a curved edge, it will work fine. So you wanna put in a couple of pins as you put your facing, then we now are putting our right sides together. 
and I'm going to prepare to stitch at 5 eighths of an inch. So you want a couple of pins here. I'm going to pin on my stitching line and I'll pin a second one as well. I think I've talked to you about this before. We have pin caddies that are magnetic. Again, pluses and minuses to that. We think that uh, it actually, the magnetism can actually weaken the pin. Sometimes we get them that break right in the center. But we use a very specific pin. It is one inch and, and one quarter inch long silk pin. So it's a very narrow shaft with a very sharp point and no head. And that's because things like this, and I'll show you a pin with a head. This is a two inch pin. It has a head and these tend to break off. So here's the difference between the pin we use. And now you can see the difference in length, the inch and a quarter versus the two inch pin. And this just can break off. You can hit it, it can melt. It just, sometimes they completely fall off and then your pin is useless. So we generally do not use this this type of a pin. You know what, at home, I like those. So, you know, whatever. <laughs> it's just that at here, we're working more on manufacturing and we're trying to make things last for a long time because our budgets are limited. I know our home budgets are limited as well. So I'm gonna put at least two pins in here and here to make sure that these edges are completely even, okay? I want my edges to be completely even so that I'm actually stitching this on and I have no, no um, edges showing. All right, I'm gonna make that a little bit better. And now I'm going to stitch. It's interesting, I'm using blue thread, shocking, I'm using a matching thread. Not exactly matching. You would wanna use matching thread always when you're sewing and have your bobbin and top thread match. All right, so I'm pinned. I'm going to stitch at my 5 eighths of an inch, back stitch, and then straight stitch all the way along here. So let's do that first. Checking to make sure I'm at two and a half. I'm at zero, thank goodness, because I was not. This is engaged and now I can do back and forward. I'm double checking everything. And a little help, a couple stitches, one, two, and back. And now I'm going to trace along my stitching line. Okay. And again, this is a curve. Remember how hard it was on our maze to do the curve? Well, this is a curve, so be careful. In fact, if you have a printer and you want to download the maze a second time, I will make an extra credit assignment page that you can just upload different things to. And that's one of the things you can get extra credit with is if you run your maze with thread. So that's on your um, portfolio page. So again, because I have pinned perpendicular to my stitching line, my needle's gonna automatically go over that pin. And I'm continuing to turn. I get to the end and I'm going to backstitch. Okay. So if I was gonna sew right now, I would lose my thread right here, Cara, because my needle is in this lower position. In order to not unthread my needle, I need to push this all the way up to the full upright position. And if I had not been holding on to this top thread right here, it would have sucked it right up into there. So that's one of the things that is typical is that we'll end and this take up lever will be in a lower position. And then when you are going to sew again, it goes up to the top first and it will pull your thread right out. So that is, that is one, of the, one of the first things to check if you keep getting unthreaded is start with about six inches and then when you, when you end of any kind of exercise, make sure that you put your take up lever in the full upright position. Here's my stitching line. I've on my little pink line, I've double back stitched. I'm gonna remove my pins. Okay, that's my five eighths. Looks just like a regular stitch. Ooh, ugly on this side. 
Look at that. See, this is what happens when thread gets caught in there. So I can untangle this a bit and I can trim some of that off, which I'll do. All right, what is my next step? Grade the seam allowances. So I'm going to cut one layer at a time. I'm gonna cut the white layer to one quarter of an inch. You don't have to measure it, just do it about in half. So I will trim this this way. Notice I'm cutting only the white layer. So you can put your thumb in between so that you know you're not cutting the bottom layer. I'm cutting only the top layer. And be careful because you don't want to cut the underside. And use a really nice sharp scissor. You can use, I when I was teaching in the spring, I was using my kitchen scissors and that's really hard. You have to just really muscle them by pinching them together here so that they're, the blades are close enough together. If you have dull scissors, you know it. Okay, so now I've trimmed this off and I can remove that. I can straighten this out because I was trimming to try and show you, so I, that's really ugly. I want it to be pretty. I want everything to be pretty. Okay, then I'm gonna trim my garment side just a little bit longer. So I have, I'm reducing the bulk, that's the whole point. So you can see, you'll always see this garment facing, this uh, garment facing, this is, now I'm cutting this piece. You'll always see it extend slightly beyond my facing or the white piece. And if you're working with something like denim and you're turning it here, you have so many layers, you really need to do this grading because it is, it's just too thick. The next thing that I'm going to do is clip because how am I going to turn this towards myself and make it be even? It will be nice and ugly like that, okay? Because I'm putting a, a smaller curve into a bigger curve. In order to accommodate that, I'm going to clip like this. I'll do it to the white side so you see. I'm not going to clip my stitching line. I'm clipping to the line about every three eighths or one half of an inch. But I'm clipping to the line, never across the line. Otherwise I will lose the integrity of my seam, okay? So I've clipped and watch what happens. Now I can spread that out flat and no problem, it's gonna be flat. If I need to do, for example, a curved collar and I want this side, then I have to notch. I'm just gonna demonstrate a notch so you see that because if I'm putting a bigger to a smaller, I'm going to cut a V out and this is in your book, right? I'm cutting a V out like this because then, oh, I can put this in front of my black shirt, because then I can move the wider into the narrower when I turn it inside out, okay? So I've clipped, I'm gonna press my facing and my seam allowances towards the facing like this away from the garment. I'm pressing it all away from my garment, all the seam allowances to the facing. Here we go. So I have my, my piece. I think you can see it fine without better with. I have my piece stitched, clipped, ready to go. And now I'm going to lay it this way. This is really awkward, right? I'm gonna use the point of my iron and I'm going to push this facing, this seam allowance towards the facing by using the point of my iron and I'm actually having to work around 
the curve, okay? Work around the curve. And when I get to my other side, I wanna make sure that it's still, it looks pretty flat, okay? And now I've, that facing is sticking up because the next step that I'm going to do when I sit at my machine is I'm going to top stitch the seam allowance to the facing. So I'm gonna do that with pins for you to see right now. I'm holding my facing and my seam allowances together and I'm going to stitch on the right side very close to my seam I'm just pinning to show you what this will be. So I'm pin doing it very close to my seam. This will be my stitching line. And you see how close it is on this side and how close it is on the inside and it attaches the facing and the seam allowance together and away from the garment. Okay, now I'll do that. Do not stitch with your pins going in that direction. This is a handheld thing. If I stitch with my pins going in this direction, it's the same direction as my needle, I guarantee you, you'll break the needle. So generally, you, if you've pressed well, you do not need to have uh, pins in it. So just make sure I'm, on a, I'm just checking all my clips are not going through because nothing's worse than stitching this and having your clips go through. You can fix it if you've done it. So I'm good. And again, I'm gonna use my presser foot. I know that this is only a quarter of an inch or three eighths is the garment side. You want the garment side longest because it will hide the rest of that facing. So I'm starting very close to my about an eighth of an inch away or half my presser foot width. And again, I'm going to go around a curve again. So I'm holding on my left hand, I'm holding the, the facing and the seam allowance together. On my right hand, I'm spreading my garment out. And it, you can do it right or left, it doesn't matter. Just the important thing is that you're getting, I'm holding the facing. And Cara, this is exactly right. This is a slow thing. You want to make sure that you're doing it appropriately. And I'm trying to see everything. I get what you're saying. It's, it is not one bit. It's certainly not intuitive and it's not easy. So just take a look. And again, we don't need to backstitch because we're not holding a seam that's gonna have stress together. So now if I was to cut, this is in the down position, I need to list that up so that I can pull my thread away and clip and leave my six inches so that I know that this is gonna pull down and up and it will not take that away. So here we go. This is what it looks like on the outside. You can see that I have stitched this to my seam allowance. Here's my original seam and here's my top stitching, which is really called the understitching. And on the inside, the side that we didn't watch, I have attached the seam allowance to the facing. So then when I want to turn it to the right side, it wants to do this automatically and you can see that stitching line. And on the right side, we do not see it at all. Let's press and finish. So now I simply am going to lay my facing down and press. So 
so that I have a nice curved edge. And I'll look at my right side as well. Yes, acceptable. So this is our finished understitching. The right side has absolutely no stitching on it. The inside is understitched, not top stitched. Top stitched would go all the way through. It's only on the facing side. Okay, is that clear for everyone? Yeah, easy when you do it, Pam. Questions? Questions on this? So you have your instructions that we did on the board. You have instructions in your on your Canvas site and you'll have the video, okay? And you also have someone else's video in case it's easier for you to understand them. So I'm looking at this. Oh, I didn't press this very nicely right here. So I'm gonna go back and press that edge to make sure that's really nice and crisp. So there's my stitching line and here's my no stitching line. So what happens is when you wear a garment, sometimes this is gonna creep up like this. And then you see that, you see that on a garment or on a neck edge and it's very unattractive. Okay, questions on understitching? Hearing none. I'm going to try and do this manual buttonhole that I talked about. So I'm gonna put it on my buttonhole piece. I know that Let's see, what size is this? All right, this is a half an inch button. So remember I need the width plus the depth, which is a, about a 16th. So I need to give myself, I'm gonna give myself a line on here so that I can mimic my whole buttonhole device. I'm putting it on this side so that you can actually see it in comparison to the other buttonhole. So I'm making my eye beam. And one thing is you wanna make sure that you really can see this piece, right? So uh, don't be shy about that. Your stitches will cover it up. I'm gonna to go to my machine. Not using this, I'm just going to use a zigzag. So as I discussed, I have my placement. I'm gonna put this, I'm gonna do a zero test and see what that's like. That's zero stitches per inch. If you have your machine like this, Cara, when you're doing your automatic buttonhole, that's why it's gonna get, that's why it's gonna stitch in place. You have to back that off, not quite to one, but like three quarters of a turn. So here's my, this is my indicator. Can you see that little tiny line right here? If that line is up on the top, I'm fully at zero. I'm gonna turn it three quarters of a turn and it's here. So we're talking very small movement, but that's gonna give me a little bit of length so that it's not gonna stitch in place and ball up, okay? So I'm going to do that as a practice. And on my stitch width, I'm going to start at one and a half. I'm just gonna take a look and see if I like that. I have a sample piece right here. I'm just gonna, just gonna play around with getting the sizes. Okay. So it's helpful that we looked at that hand sewing because I can look at this and say, you know what? I think that's close enough together. Now, if I wanna make it closer together, I make my stitch length less. So I'm going to do it a quarter of a turn less. And I'm going to do that stitch again so that we can see what it looks like side by side. Again, cutting my extraneous threads so that they're not going to get caught up in my bobbin. This is really important. You want to make sure that you don't have a bunch of extraneous threads in this bobbin case. So I'm, again, I have simply changed this one quarter of a turn so that my stitch width is the same, but my length is gonna make it closer together. Okay, my needle's in. I'm gonna make 
one full turn. So my take up lever goes to the full upright position, pull my thread away and snip close to my garment. Get rid of any extraneous threads. And now I'm looking at the density of this one quarter of a turn. Look at how much with that stitch length shortened, how different that made that buttonhole. If you're working on a heavier fabric like this piece, which is a twill, pretty heavy denim, no problem. If you're working on lighter weight, then the, then the one that's a little longer might be more appropriate. Okay, again, that goes based on your garment. Now I'm gonna go and do one stitch uh, towards me. And at the termination point, I'm going to change my stitch width. So I want you to take a look at that. So I'm gonna put a little eye bar on here. So here's my eye bar. I'm gonna stitch down and then I'll change my stitch width and let's see how that works. So I'm gonna look right through there and start my needle on one side of my pencil line. I'm keeping everything the same as I have approved that stitch. Okay, now with my needle up, I'm going to go to four or five, and I'm just gonna test and see what that's gonna do. Okay, it's gonna make it go a little further than I expected, so I'm gonna move my, okay. You guys don't wanna do this necessarily, but I'm gonna show you. By just moving that, I have made my, my uh, bar tack happen, okay? So my bar tack is here, and then I'm gonna make my next stitch come down the other side. What I would have done is I would have left my needle in here, Trying to reposition is really tough. Okay, now I'm smack in there. I'm gonna turn my fabric around so that I can stitch back down to my side. If you're using an automatic button holder, it will probably back stitch to the original place because it's better to stitch um, in the same direction both ways, but that's really complicated when you're doing this. So I'm gonna put this down. I'm gonna lift my needle back up. Okay, that's gonna make it go, I should have put it on the other side so that I can move this back to one and a half width and then I can stitch this, I'm gonna do a sample. Okay, that looks pretty good. I'm not actually there yet. I'm gonna just move it back onto my bar tack and I'm gonna stitch down to the bottom of my I-beam. And I'm there lift up my needle, put it to, I think maybe four is a better one, but I'll try that. I'm gonna just test it out. And then I wanna see if it's gonna go beyond that. Okay, so it seems like it wants to go past where my stitching line is and I don't like that. So I'm gonna do bar tack. That's a little too wide. Three to six stitches and then I put it to zero and I put this to zero and it will stitch in place, not moving and that locks it. So you have to be precise and you have to practice, but you can get a passable buttonhole. So this is where I had the stitch a bit too wide and you'd want to note, okay, I'm gonna either widen the area in between or I'm gonna make my bar tack at four and a half. And then I can clip that. I'm gonna do a clip by folding and using my very sharp scissors, not clipping that you really have to be careful so that you're not clipping your stitching. That's why I like the razor blade because it's super narrow. Oh, 
Okay. And then I'll button it on top of my button that I used as my sample piece and see how that goes. I thought I clipped my buttonhole because this thread was hanging out, so but I didn't. So I'm so, so glad because, boy, you don't want to do that at the end. And here it is. Okay, so that works perfectly. Questions? Okay, let's take a break. We'll come back at 11 o'clock. That's, I have 15 minutes. And we're gonna talk about our crew handbook from sketch to stage. All right, taking a break. I will break this into two recordings so that this, the understitching is on one and the crew handbook is on another one. So I can second and put it into a separate, um, a separate window. And you know what, I think I can do it right here. 